So when, uh, when Craig asked me and Sarah asked me to come and speak about minimalism and minimal and what that means, I, it was a real, at first I was like, yeah, fine, yeah, I'll come and talk about that. Uh, and then I sat down and really started thinking about it and about what, what minimal means to me and what minimalism in design means to me. Uh, it, it really started a couple of weeks of, of quite a bit of thinking, really. Uh, of which the, the, the results of all that thinking I'm going to talk you through today. Um, so when, when we think about minimal, I'm going to talk today about design specifically. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about leading a minimal life or minimalism in music or the art movement or anything like that. I'm, I'm going to talk about what it means you know, to me personally. So it may be something different to you. But to me, when I think of minimalism, I think about this kind of stuff. Right? I don't know what that is. Uh, it could be a toilet. I don't really know. Um, you know, I think of I, I think a lot of, of, of physical spaces. Uh, I think a lot of products. But um, what does it mean to me in my design work? I don't do this kind of stuff. I design websites. Uh, really, the essence of minimalism to me can be summed up by uh, by this guy. So perfection is achieved not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. So th for, for, for me, minimalism is about that. It's a subtractive process, right? Uh, it starts with something, and then you remove things. But, uh, but at some time in the past 40, 50 years, uh, that changed. And minimalism was no longer about subtracting, and it was no longer about this kind of process. It was about style. So I've got a thing about taps. Uh, I've got a growing collection of photographs of taps. It's a bit of a dirty secret. Uh, I've got about 100 or so now of taps that were dreadful taps. Uh, and this is a dreadful tap. Uh, you can see it's quite minimal, right? But it's dreadful. So th th I can't even remember where this was. But I, um, does anyone else suffer from ghost hands with taps? You know where you put your hands underneath the things and they don't work? Uh, that I suffer from ghost hands, and this was um, this was a, a, a tap where I, you know, ghost hands was in effect. This thing over on the right there was not a uh, was not a handle for the tap. I don't even know what that did or does. Uh, there was just a sensor underneath. But the problem is, is I put my hands underneath, and it uh, it soaked my wrists. It didn't wet my hands at all. Uh, taps should not require instructions to use. This was in St. Luke's in London. Uh, apparently, this is something to do with safe uh, hygiene, which is why there are infrared um, sensors on taps. I think mean, that's a load of nonsense because you're washing your hands. Well, you know, hygiene, you're actually making yourself cleaner in the process. Um, so I think that the. Why am I talking to you about taps? Well, there's. Minimalism to me is about truth of a thing, right? It's the thinginess of a thing. When you take stuff away from a thing and you're left with just the thing that works on its own, there's truth in that. And this comes from kind of modernism, right? Truth in materials. You see this, you know, all around. The car park over the road, right? That has, you know, leanings towards modernism. And they're making no apologies for the fact it's made from gross concrete, right? And, and that is that's purposeful. So when I started out designing uh, on the web, well, I didn't start out designing on the web, really. I started out wanting to be a, uh, a book designer. So I went to a university in, um, in Portsmouth. And while I was there, uh, I, you know, every student, you know, those of you who have been to university, at the, end of, uh, at the end of the course, you have to write you know, 20,000 words on something for a, for a dissertation. And I wanted to write on... Uh, you know, I went into the, I can't 
can't remember what day it was. But I went in to speak to the lecturer and I've been thinking about um, what to write. And it was a time of David Carson, of Emma Gray magazine. Uh, it was a time of, of, uh, of an explosion of, of really interesting graphic design, right? And uh, I went in there thinking, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write, I'm gonna write uh, an essay about this. I'm going uh, to explore postmodern graphic design. And she, I sat down there and explained all this you know, very excitedly to, uh, to my lecturer. And she sat there you know, very patiently nodding, yes, yes, mm, very interesting. Of course, every student for the past two hours had gone in and said exactly the same thing. Right. So uh, she said, why don't you, you know, go and have a think about what you're really interested in. I was like, well, I'm interested in this. I don't want to go ahead and think about, you know, I'm interested in other things, but they're not really design related. She's like, well, what, what are those things? I was like, well, I don't know. I'm reading a book by William Gibson at the moment, and I quite like, you know, the cyberpunk literature, you know, it's interesting. She's like, well, that's interesting. Go away and, and look at that. So anyway, she kind of persuaded me to write a, uh, a dissertation on cyber, Gibsonian cyberpunk culture which is just 20,000 words of nonsense, really. Uh, but anyway, what happened throughout that is that that informed the, the work that I did at the end of university. So this was like 1995, 1994. And so if you, if you think back to that time, uh, what was happening in music, what was happening in television, in films and modern society, it was very much reflected in the design work that was happening at the time. And a lot of, uh, a lot of my peers on my uh, course were, you know, doing beautiful printouts of, this, of, of beautiful compositions of work, you know, holding them up, taking photographs of them, kind of thing design students do. Uh, and I started looking at the web, and the web was really, really rudimentary in those, those days. So it was, uh, it was pretty poor. It looked like this. Right, and well, that's one of uh, this is the first website. Um, now, the reason why I got attracted to the web was that there was no cost to publish something. There was no cost to produce something. On screen, there's no material cost. Right, you don't have to buy steel. You don't have to. You don't have to wait for a supply chain. You don't have to spend time ordering things. Uh, if I, so uh, the people on the course, if I printed something out, it was an old dye sublimation printer. Remember dye sub printers? Uh, and these were like A2 or A1 uh, printouts. And they cost five quid a time. I used to live on 10 quid a week. So if I printed something out as a typo, you know, I'd be screwed. I'd eat beans for the rest of the week. This represented something where I could just press a button and make a change and press a button again and it would work. So to me, minimalism is really about this material truth. So it's the barest of, the, uh, barest of essentials, right? And you have to be truthful for the materials that are used. So if you take that, right? Minimalism is, is material truth. Well, this isn't minimal but it's truthful. This is my lounge uh, last year. Uh, this was a, an, a fireplace that was uh, being made by the, uh, a, a stonemason called Di Cook. He's the Welshest Welshman you've ever met in your life. He's perfectly round and with massive hands. He's perfectly designed for carrying rocks. Uh, and he, um, he, he uh, spent like a week making this thing. And it was an absolute mess, right? But there's material truth here in what he's doing. He's not trying to make this look like anything else. But this isn't minimal. This isn't minimalism. This is also my house. This is just kind of like home photographs throughout this. Maybe the odd holiday snap. Uh, no, there isn't really. At least I hope there isn't. Um, this is a, a light switch from my hall. And uh, there's a good DIY tip here if you ever change your one. Is take a photograph of where the wires go before you change the wires. Uh, that's what this photograph is. Now, I changed it because I wanted a more minimal light switch. I didn't like the one the electrician put in. So I thought, oh, I'll change this. It didn't work. I mean, well, it looks nice, but it doesn't work anymore. Even by doing this, I screwed it up somehow. 
how, you know, how can you do it? So now when I come in, I, uh, I, I press a button and the light doesn't come on and I have to go into another room to pull a light switch to go back into that other room to turn on another light switch so that the entrance hall light comes on. I have no idea. It should just get a man in, really. But the, the point being is uh, behind this facade of minimalism, right, it's a mess, right? Really, that, that's... That brings me to my next point, which is a lot of minimalism in design is really just kind of a veneer over a natural mess and a natural order, right? You, you've heard about the, um, in physics, uh, entropy, right? Things will tend towards being a mess. And one of the problems that we have as designers is that whenever we start things, we, we try and create order and, and, uh, and, and cleanliness out of the mess that is the natural world, right? But the natural world doesn't work like that. Physics doesn't work like that. Things will always tend to a mess. Uh, and that's where, for me, minimalism starts to break down as, a, as an approach and as a, as a uh, you know, uh, as, a, as a, uh, an end point to a process. And for a long time, I think that designers, and certainly I've been guilty of it, we see it as simplicity and minimalism as this goal that we should achieve. And I think it's really kind of uh, trendy right now. I'll show a couple of examples later on where I think it's, uh, it's you know, the, we, we tend towards this place, but there's real damage that can be done if we do that. Um, this guy, uh, Schumacher, was, uh, he's brilliant. He's a, there's a great book called Small is Beautiful um, that he wrote in the early part of the century. He worked for the coal board in the UK, this German guy, but he was, um, he was an economist. Um, so if you can't read that, any intelligent fool can make things bigger, more complex, and more violent. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. So in my job, you know, when I'm working, I, as Sarah said, I work for Monotype now, so I'm in-house, I work for a big organization listed on the NASDAQ. Um, and before that, we worked with big clients. I was, used to work at the BBC. And big organizations are really complicated and really complex. And the default position in places like this is additive. Is if something doesn't work or we've got a problem, let's fix it by adding something to it. It's very rarely in my experience that you fix something, in, in a large organization like that, you fix something by taking something, something away by removing things, by removing a product from a product line, by uh, taking out functions, functions and uh, features from, a, from an application, by uh, scrapping the, the, the corporate identity and really, really going back to basics. Why? Because it takes courage and it's really hard. Um, so let me just talk you through an example where um, I think that, that minimalism can can kind of be dangerous, and I think it can also be somewhat inhuman. Um, what if you owned a restaurant, right? And your job was, in this restaurant, was to simply make people smile. That was it, right? You were, you were brought on board to say, okay, the food's good in this restaurant. You know, people come here and, uh, you know, they order food. So let's say it's a fish and chip shop. Right, so it's not a high-brow restaurant, it's a fish and chip shop. You know, people like fish and chips, they'll always buy fish and chips. Uh, but how do you make people smile and just that little bit extra? Well, I don't think you really necessarily uh, go a minimalist approach in a classical kind of the way that minimalism is your head. Some of the, the examples that I showed earlier on. So this was from a fish and chip shop in Tenby. Uh, and I love this, and a few of you are smiling. And that's the point, right? This isn't minimalism, though. And I don't think you can get this kind of humor with minimalism. Minimalism's terribly serious. This is my local butcher's. Alan doesn't work there anymore, unfortunately. He retired. He was something like the fifth generation butcher that had worked in this shop. Uh, this is supermarket. This is meat from Asda, two for five quid, quality meat. Um, this is meat from America. That's an A. There's a B there. Um, right. 
When I go to my butchers, I'm not just buying meat. When people went and stood, the problem with Alan is he talked too bloody much. Uh, and people loved him for it. There'd be, queue, there'd be a queue right down here every Saturday morning at 8 a.m. because he'd spend 20 minutes with every customer talking about, uh, well, just nonsense, really. And, and on the, on the, when you'd go in there, the meat would be hung, would just be on, on slabs of marble, you know, weird-looking bits of meat, like half a cow, like a leg, a whole leg of something. Uh, and he'd be like, you're like, what's that? And he's like, it's where bacon comes from. You know, it's pretty cool. Um, so what Alan was doing here was he was telling a very, very kind of rich story. Inadvertently, he's just a nice guy, sells meat. You know, he's a butcher. It wasn't what he did, it's what he was. Uh, and he still goes in there now, even though he sold the place, supposed to be retired, is run by somebody else uh, who he doesn't really know that well. He still goes in there just to talk to people. What he's doing here just by the environment and what he did is he's telling a very, very rich story. And this brings me on to brands, right? And the thing, the thing that's not often talked about brands is the, you hear this all the time, right? Brands are stories. Brands are stories. Brands aren't logos. Brands are stories. But what does that actually mean? How is that story told? And I, uh, in, in physical things, anyway, is told through interfaces, systems, and materials. And that's how stories are told, because a, f- a phone or, a, or, or this, ooh, nearly fell over. Uh, this, <laughs> I thought it was attached to the floor. Um, this can't give you a sales pitch. Neither can a phone, right? This space that Craig and Amy have, have created can't give you a sales pitch. But the stories in the stuff that's in here Right? So what's the story here? Or here? Or here? Incidentally, I'm not sure, you, it's one thing that I picked up on the last week with Google's announcement. The stuff that Google are doing is pretty cool. I mean, it's good that they've turned from an organization that really uh, design was a cost, like in the same way that marketing was, or something like that, into uh, they're taking a lot more seriously, right? But they're tending towards the same place as Apple, right? And the reason being is that at the core of what they're trying to do is this word, minimal. And for 50 years, minimal has changed from being something of uh, a reductive process where you take things away to being a, a label that you give something that carries loads of baggage. And quite often that's to the detriment of, of the products and also detriment to um, difference, right? And that's one thing that's kind of a shame with Google is that really how much difference is there between the design of the interfaces of those two things? And if brand is something that is told through materials, interfaces and systems, what story at Google saying that is different to Apple? So I believe in a reductionist approach to my work. I still believe in that. And I believe in the thinginess of the thing. I believe in a material truth. And I believe in getting to the core of, of the materials that you use and not trying to, 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 to make them something else. And I believe in the rich stories, materials, systems, uh, that, and, that interfaces tell. I believe in those brand stories but I do not believe in minimalism because I think that uh, as soon as we use this label, we start to conform and we start to produce work that is inhuman to a degree that's devoid of uh, of humor. And we start prioritizing form over function instead of the perfect marriage of the two. So I'm I'm one and saying that let's leave uh, minimalism firmly in the past where it belongs. Thank you very much.